my name is Lawrence Moroni. I'm a developer advocate at Google, and um, I'm really happy to be here today. This is my first time in Vienna, and I always like read these surveys of like the most beautiful cities in the world to live in. And I live near Seattle, and Seattle is pretty close to Vancouver. And Vancouver in Canada always finishes in second place, and Vienna always finishes in first. And so I was like really delighted to come and see Vienna, and it was just I can see why it finishes first. It's a beautiful, beautiful city. I've heard great things about the tap water here, but I haven't been brave enough to drink it yet. So <laughs> work with me on that and help me to drink some. I, I got some down with water earlier and I ended up with a little bit of tap water before I leave. So um, I wanted to begin, uh, instead of just talking about a product and you know telling you about some of the stuff that we're working on at Google, I wanted to take a little bit of a rewind from that and say why we're working on some of the stuff that we work at Google and what's the reason behind some of the things that we're doing. So to begin with this, I'd like to tell a little story. And this story goes back, and just to show how mobile development has changed over the years. This story goes back about five years. And I was working for a different company. I wasn't working for Google. I was working for another software company, really small one you might have heard of, called Microsoft. You guys from anybody? Okay, good. And my job at Microsoft was I was a product manager for the Windows Phone platform. And the goal of my job was to help Windows Phone become a successful mobile platform. <laughs> Very hard job, I can assure you. But as part of this, what we decided to do was to do a little experiment. And the experiment that we did was to say, let's pick an app. And we were, Windows, mobile, Windows Phone 7 was just launching. Android was just emerging as a personal platform. And iOS was really owning the smartphone market at that time. So we said, what we'll do to show developers why we have the best platform We'll pick a very simple application, and we're going to build that application on Windows Phone, we're going to build that application on iOS, and we're going to build that on that application on Android or Droid. And we ended up, I came up with a very simple scenario for an application that was an English to French translator. And we had an API at the time for the Microsoft Translator or Bing Translator or whatever they called it at the time. It keeps changing its name. And uh, the idea was a very simple application would be one text entry field, one button, and one text rendering field. And you type something in in English in the text entry field, you push the button, and then the field would render the translation for you. So you have a very simple translation. So we said, we know that if we build this application, we show how easy it is to do this in Visual Studio and C Sharp, that developers will go, wow, we have the best platform. You know, everybody will talk to Windows Phone 7 and everybody will build it on that platform. And I built the application on Windows Phone 7 in about half an hour. And I deployed it to the Windows Phone store in about half an hour. And I documented the whole thing. So then I said, okay, the next thing I'm going to do is Android. So at the time, Android Studio didn't exist. So I was using Eclipse. And I used Eclipse and I, I knew Java, but I had to learn a little bit about the Android SDK. And then I had to figure out how activities work. And, I have to figure out how, like, how you do different things in Android. It was a bit of a learning curve. But I wrote the application with including the learning curve in about a day. And then I put it in what's called the Android Marketplace. Anybody remember that? I see no, okay, it's good. It's another place over the Android Marketplace. I put the application in there. And it took a little bit of figuring out how to compile it, and how to sign it, and how to put it in the store. And that was taking me a little bit longer. And I was like, yes, okay, this is hard. And then I started doing it. In <laughs> and I was like, what the heck is this NS stuff and what are like outlets and what are all these things that I'm dragging and dropping in Xcode and I have no idea what I'm doing and I just I finally got the application to work and then to try and call the backend API over HTTP and trying to pass keys and trying to pass credentials and the documentation just it made my head spin. And it took me about a week to figure it out. And I finally got it working. And then I tried to deploy it to the App Store. <laughs> Anybody remember how hard that used to be? And so all the certificates that you needed, all the provisioning profiles, and trying to put profiles on a to test device, and it was a nightmare. It took me about two weeks to do this whole thing. But I finally got it in the store. And I finally was like, we are going to be huge with Windows Phone 7 because it's so easy, but it's so hard on iOS. Deployed it to the free stores, wrote up all my stuff, made videos, spoke about it with developers at conferences, all that kind of thing. And then, can anybody guess what happened next? 
people started buying the application. And on the iPhone platform in particular, thousands of people started buying the application. On the Windows Phone platform, nobody bought the application. <laughs> right? and, and I found, and I, well, at the time I thought it was really interesting because I found it like an order of magnitude harder to build it on Android than it was on Windows. And then an order of magnitude harder to build it on iOS than it was on Android at the time. So I had this really steep curve. But then after a few months when I looked at the sales, I had one or two sales on Windows. I had an order of magnitude more sales on Android. And then I had an order of magnitude more sales on iOS. And this was like five or six years ago when the gold rush in mobile development was really happening. And what we discovered from this was that it really didn't matter how easy we made the platform. It really didn't matter all of the investment that we put into making the platform. Because if mobile developers couldn't be successful, it didn't matter. You know, if, I, if you could build this app in half an hour in C Sharp, you wouldn't do it. You'd still spend the two weeks to build it on iOS and a couple of days to build it on Android, because that's where the success was. And then the irony was, like, half of my department that I was working with all left and became independent mobile developers, including me. You know, we all went into consulting, building Android apps and building iOS apps because we saw that's what the success was. And who cares how easy it was to do coding? So, we fast forward now a few years from that, and that goal rush has kind of ended. And mobile developers have somewhat more of a challenge. So, I've been looking at some research, and some research that was done by Vision Mobile, who did the State of the Developer Network survey, and it's the largest <coughs> survey of developers in the world. And they reported this number recently. This number, 51%. This is the number of mobile developers today that are below, below what they call the poverty line. And the poverty line is where your app is making $500 or less per month. So the majority of developers, 51%, are below that line. And that to me was a staggering statistic when I saw it. And not only that, it's growing. Six months ago, it was 50%. You know, this quarter is 51%. Growing a small amount, but still growing. This number, on the other hand, 29%, this is the number of developers that are doing really, really well in mobile. And that's, uh, that's making like 2500 sorry, $25,000 or more per month on their mobile apps. So which would you rather be? Part of the 51% or part of the 29%? So as we're working at Google to develop the platforms that we're building, we want to help developers become more part of that 29%. So how do we help you to succeed? How do we help you not to be in the 51% below the, what the vision mobile call the poverty line? And how do we help you to be part of that 29%? And that's why we do what we do at Google. It's really, it's our job to help you succeed because when you think about it, if you succeed as mobile developers, the mobile ecosystem succeeds, Android succeeds, we succeed, right? So it's, you know, it's a part of we're trying to put together this virtual cycle to help you guys succeed. And one of the reasons for this, and part of how we're doing this, and just to show the developer earnings, this is the chart of it. Um, you see there's the folks over on the right-hand side here. We wanted to take a look at the habits of these folks, so the folks who are making 25K or more. What do they do? What are they doing to succeed? They're not building a simple little translator app like the one that I built that now makes zero. It was doing really well a few years ago, but now it makes zero. Um, so what do the people in the $25,000 or more bracket? What do they do to succeed? So first, the first thing that we saw was one of the habits was that of these, 88% of them target the three dominant mobile platforms that we see today. And they are Android, globally, iOS, in particular in the US, but more and more emerging now with mobile web. So the mobile web browser, as you know, is more and more powerful. It's far more useful than it used to be just a couple of years ago. And that effectively has become the third major platform that we see successful developers targeting. So we said, OK, they're targeting all three of these. They're not targeting one. They're not targeting two. They're targeting all three. So if we're building anything to support developers, we want to build not just the best SDKs for you to build your Android apps on, but we want to build the best SDKs, the best support, the best middleware that will allow you, if you're targeting all three of these platforms, to be able to succeed on them. And that's where we came up with Firebase. Now, we didn't really come up with Firebase. Firebase was a product that existed. Um, it was an independent product that Google acquired about 18 months ago. And, but 
we were working on something that we called the Google Model Platform. And the goal behind the Google Model Platform was, as I said, to help developers to be successful, to take a look at the habits of the highly successful developers, and to provide the facilities for everybody to be able to do what the highly successful ones are doing. And we saw Firebase, the real anybody who's heard of Firebase before Google acquired it or anybody who used it? Yeah, cool, a few hands. And you know, Firebase was this excellent real-time backend database. We fell in love with it when we started using it. And we said we, you know, it would make perfect sense for this to be part of a much bigger strategy. You know, a real-time database, a backend database, something that requires little infrastructure is awesome, but it's not enough in its own right. It has to be part of a bigger whole. So then when we purchased that and we built out what we were calling the Google, Google Mobile Platform, and then we launched it at IO 16, we realized that you know, it's better to reduce confusion and just keep the Firebase name because Firebase itself was awesome. So to give a little bit of an overview of, to, of what we did with Firebase, thinking in terms of why we did it, we realized that the habits of these successful developers really fall into four buckets. The first one is you have a great SDK, you've got the iOS SDK for building iOS apps, you've got so many great web frameworks for building web apps, and of course you've got the Android SDK for building Android apps. And we realized that beyond that SDK, to build a successful app, there's a lot of other infrastructure that you need to do that works cross-platform. So that's what we were calling the develop part of this, the purple part of this diagram. And there's a number of things in there, and I'm going to go through each one of them individually, so that you know these are the things that we think will help you build better apps and be successful app developers. But beyond just developing your app, it's all too often nowadays folks will build an app, they'll put it into the app store, they'll put some marketing behind it, they'll have some initial success, and then nothing. Because there's so much competition, there are so many apps in the store, you know, there are new apps going in daily into the iOS app store, into the Play Store, all of these things, and it's very, very hard for you to distinguish yourself amongst all this competition. And most developers don't have big marketing departments behind them, don't have big social like marketing areas behind them. And it's very hard for an app to go viral if it's just you promoting and you pushing it yourself. So we want to apply some areas of technology that will help you grow your app by engaging your users. And then finally, of course, sorry, not finally, the third of these is it's very important for you to earn some money off of your app. Now, there's typically two ways that uh, developers will do this. One is that they have app purchase or in-app purchases. But we see that that's getting less and less popular, um, that it's getting harder and harder to sell apps because most users are demanding apps to be free or at least some kind of freemium model. And of course, we provide that in the Play Store. But we also realized that one of the greatest earners for apps is in-app advertising. So we said, let's work on building the best possible in-app advertising SDK so that as you are building out your application, we want to make it easy for you to have in-app ads that are smart, that have got great ad inventory. And when I say ads being smart, Think about it in terms of uh, if you're building an application, for example, for sports scores, uh, you're not going to want to serve adverts for children's diapers or nappies or I'm not sure what they call them in this country. Uh, so, and so you need to have relevant contextual ads, otherwise people are either going to turn off your app if you're serving really bad adverts, or they're just not going to interact with the ad at all and you're not going to benefit from that. So a really intelligent ad network. And then um, all of this is then tied together by analytics. And analytics, to me, are a very interesting conundrum. Because, I don't know about you, but I've been in so many meetings where it was a case of we're building some kind of an application, and we want to put analytics into it, but then marketing say the analytics should be this, this, and this. Business dev say it should be something else. Engineering say it should be something else. Marketing say it should be something else. Else. The engineering manager has to figure out which of these analytics we're going to build into the application, try and put that onto a schedule, and then you either end up doing everything or you end up doing nothing. And it's, it's a really, really tough task. So we wanted to make sure that the task of building analytics was as easy as possible for developers, and the analytics that you can get were as powerful as possible for you to understand what's going on in your app. So let's look at some of these. I'll start with analytics. And the biggest problem that I mentioned 
you know, before something like Firebase Analytics and Google Analytics came along, was figuring out which analytics to put in your app. How are you going to spend the engineering cost on those analytics? How are you going to use those analytics? What kind of things are you going to measure? The amount of negotiation that needed to be done. You know, some people would say the most important analytic is app opens. Another person would say, no, the most important analytic is app close. Another person might say it's time in app. Another person might say it's time on a particular activity or screen within the app. And there was so many awkward meetings when building apps about which analytics to build in that, you know, more often than not, we didn't do any. This was when I was working as an independent app consultant about everybody said they wanted analytics, nobody could decide on the analytics that they wanted, they usually ran at the time and didn't get them built in. So we said, okay, as Google now, if we're putting analytics into an app, we want to solve that problem. There's two ways that we solve that problem. The first one is to make it free. The second one is to make it unlimited. So when I say free, I mean free in two different ways. The first of these is that it doesn't cost you anything. But the second of these, and perhaps the most important, is that there are a whole bunch of analytics points that are collected in the application for you simply by linking in the Firebase libraries to your application. You don't have to write any code. All of the major common analytics are collected for you. Things like screen open, screen closed, you know, when did you go to this activity, when did the user leave this at that activity. Those types of things that, if you follow the 80-20 rule, the 80% of the analytics that most applications will use are going to automatically be collected for you once you make Firebase into your application. And as a result, all these awkward engineering meetings that I was talking about, they go away. And it makes it so much simpler for you to start building your app and start measuring how your app works. And to give an example of this, I once worked with a company that was, uh, before we launched Firebase, that was building casual games. And they just couldn't figure out why people weren't playing their game for long. They had no idea. They had great reviews, they had great feedback, but they would take a look at their analytics and they would say, hey look, you know, people would launch the game, play for two minutes, and then close it, and then maybe never come back to it. So, for them, the most important analytic, once they linked Firebase and was available to them, was that when do people leave my application? What screen are we on when people leave the application? And it turned out that they had a game with a number of levels on it. I can't remember the number, I think it showed 20 levels in the game. And most people would play to about level 3 and then quit. And of course, what happened was level 4 was much too difficult. You know, in a good game, the difficulty level was up like this. But in their case, they went to level three, and then the difficulty of level four went up like that. And they didn't know that. They didn't have that intelligence. They didn't see that. Until they started linking analytics into their application, until they started seeing, hey, look, lots of people playing level one, lots of people that playing level two, lots of people that playing level three, nobody playing level four. Um, so that's the power of the kind of things that you can do with analytics. But in their case, instead of spending engineering time, spending negotiation times, burning all these calories, trying to figure out what analytics to put in, they realized that they had an exit analytic that could see where people were leaving the application. And as a result, they were able to change that, turn it around, and be successful. So as an example of this, this is if you're using Firebase, and if you've linked Firebase into your application, you can browse a Firebase console. And we have a game that we shipped at Hot Bingo Blast that some folks from Google built and shipped prior to I.O. so that we could gather some analytics so that we could show it and download it. It's open source if you want to go and download it. But here's an example screen of some of the analytics that they were able to get you know, out of uh, Bingo Blast. And you can see, in this case, it was like they were looking at earnings from in-app purchases. Um, I don't have a live demo here, so I can't go through all of the analytics, but things like in this one, you can see where people enter the app, where people spend most time in it, where people are leaving the app, all that kind of thing. But what I can't reiterate enough, I'm not an analytics expert, and you don't have to be. You know, you just link Firebase into your application, you get the analytics collected for you, and then you can give this to your marketing people so they can figure out what's working, what's not, and then you can start improving and continually improving your application. So next up, we're all developers here, and let's talk about developing your application. So you're here at DroidCon, you probably know your Android SDK very well, so I'm not going to be talking a lot about the Android SDK, I'm going to be talking about the services that we've built to support you, middleware services, those kind of things. So first of these is the real-time database. So this is what Firebase was originally, when we purchased Firebase and we brought it into the Google platform, and we brought it into this holistic Google mobile platform. 
But if you're not familiar with it, it's a cloud-hosted NoSQL database. The idea is that um, previously, before something like Firebase existed, you would have to build a database that runs on a web server or a database that runs on the cloud. But think about all the infrastructure that you'd have to build, even if it was on the cloud. You'd have like maybe a SQL Server database or a MySQL database running on a cloud platform. You'd have to build an application platform in front of that that provided the CRUD operations in between your application and the database. You'd have to build an API layer around that so that your application can talk to this back end. And there's a lot of plumbing, there's a lot of infrastructure we didn't have to build. The idea behind Firebase's real-time database is all of that gets abstracted for you and you just make simple calls and the database is just there in the cloud for you. It's no SQL based. And then some of the more advanced things that you need to do for mobile applications, for example, like synchronizing data. Um, how many of you use more than one mobile device? Almost everybody, right? You, know, you have a watch, you have a phone, you have a tablet. You know, there's so many things that, so many devices that you have. And if you're running an application across all three of these, having the data synchronized across all three of them, or how many that you have, is essential. It's a lot of work for an engineer on the back end to build that. So part of the idea behind Firebase is it automatically manage, manages all of that for you. Uh, so that's the idea, that's what Firebase is all about, the real-time database. And here's just a visualization of it. You know, even if I'm using this, if your application runs in the web browser on the desktop, any changes that you make get filtered from the cloud to all of your devices so you can synchronize. And one of the most difficult things to do from an engineering perspective is, well, what happens if I go offline? So if I have a mobile device, I'm commonly going offline. So I have my data state in one device. Like, for example, if you travel to another country and you have activity for a while, on the device SIM card, um, how does things happen if I have the data on one that's connected and I have the data on another that's disconnected? What happens? How do I get these things reconnected? How do I synchronize them? You can build that yourself, and it's a lot of work, or that's one of the reasons why we built this into Firebase, to prevent you to help you that you don't need to build it by yourself. You don't need to burn those calories. You don't need to spend that engineering time to have that kind of synchronization done for you. So that's the real-time database in Firebase. The next one for developers, and one that we hear that a lot of developers are challenged by, and it's getting more and more difficult given the hacker society that we're living in, is having good authentication and good user management within our applications. Requirement number one is that uh, it's very difficult for you to build your own user authentication environment because you're going to be collecting personal data from people. That personal data could be compromised and stolen. So a lot of developers come to us and say, we just want to sign in with Facebook. We just want to sign in with Twitter. We just want to sign in with Google. Uh, can we get that in a single API? So that's why we've built it. That's why we built this in Firebase uh, user management or Firebase authentication. The idea then for you as a developer, instead of rolling your own uh, authentication infrastructure and user management infrastructure, you can just use the one that was in Firebase. By the way, this is all free. This doesn't cost anything. Or, of course, if you have an existing auth system that you want to integrate, of course we'll integrate with that too. And then the user interface, you need to get out-of-the-box branding, so people are familiar with Twitter branding and Facebook branding and Google branding. You get that out-of-the-box, but of course if you have your own auth system and you want to be able to put your branding onto your application that's integrated with our infrastructure, you can do that also. So again, this was driven by people coming to us saying we really, really need to have authentication and personalization in our applications, but it's very expensive to maintain, it's very expensive to implement. Help us. So as we were building out our mobile platform that became Firebase, this became a priority for us. And Tim is actually going to be talking about that tomorrow morning. So Tim is up here. Um, if, uh, if you want to learn more about the Firebase authentication, Tim's got a really detailed talk. Pretty good stuff. Next up was that most common app, most uh, applications require some kind of hosting. Uh, it might be as simple as if you're putting an application, for example, into the iOS app store, you need a website. Uh, and so, as uh, part of the validation process, you need a website that you know the Apple will go to take a look at, see if you're legitimate, see if you're not pushing some kind of fake app into the app store. If you don't want to go to the bother or go to the trouble or go to the expense building a website, you know, putting a domain name on that, maintaining that website, all of these kind of things. And static hosting is available to you in Firebase also. Now, you notice I said the word static. It's static hosting, so it's for basic stuff, HTML files, PHP, not PHP, sorry, HTML files, CSS, 
you know, uh, images, those kind of things. So if you need a very simple website and you don't want to go out to a third party provider or you don't want to build up a cloud platform or something like that, it's very easy for you to just put together your website, host those assets in Firebase hosting, and then map a domain to that. So again, just try to make it easier for you to be able to build and succeed with apps by taking away a lot of these onerous tasks that are necessary and making it as easy as possible for you. Next up is storage. So often applications, media, for example, building a photography application, or you're building something where users want to store files, and you want to store those files in the cloud. How do you do this? Well, you could go to a cloud vendor, we're a cloud vendor too, and you can purchase cloud storage options, and you can figure out the APIs for those cloud storage options, you can figure out how to authenticate, do all of this kind of stuff against that cloud storage, and then you can build that into your application so then your users can upload those files. Absolutely no problem, of course, that's what most people do today. But again, thinking that 29% of developers were highly successful, they're doing that, but we want to make it easier to do that. So we built the cloud storage APIs into Firebase, which are for file storage, video files, whatever, uh, those kind of things. They had, and then we built a lot of the infrastructure that handles things, for example, as poor connectivity to you. So if your user needs to download a file and the file download gets interrupted, how do you handle a handshake? How do you handle you know, keeping files and saying that that kind of stuff? All of this is built into the infrastructure for you. And it's ultimately it's built on Google's cloud storage platform, but we just built a wrapper around that to make it easier. One of my favorites is uh, Google Cloud Messaging. Anybody use Google Cloud Messaging? Oh wow, a lot of you, cool. So Google Cloud Messaging migrated and became Firebase Cloud Messaging. And uh, the idea was that it's, you know, from an infrastructure perspective, from an API perspective, it's pretty much the same thing. Um, we recommend that you migrate to Firebase Cloud Messaging going forward because a lot of the innovation is going to be going into that. And the idea behind this was that it's a real-time messaging platform and no cost to you. Because we realized that app notifications, real-time messages, all those type of things are, success, are vital nowadays for a successful application. If you want to be part of the 29% that we talked about earlier, that's one of the things that's necessary. And the idea again is that we wanted to make that part of this unified SDK, make it easier for you to be able to build messaging into your applications. And make it versatile for you to I shouldn't use the word targeting, but make it versatile for you to be able to reach your users with those notifications. You might want to only reach your iOS users, you might only want to reach your Android users with a particular notification. Or maybe you just want to reach users who've made an in-app purchase in the last three months. Or maybe you want to reach users who haven't done an in-app purchase in the last three months. These kind of uh, ways of notifications to reach your users are all built into this. And I mentioned analytics earlier on, you can drive all of this off of analytics as well. Another one of my favorites is remote config. Remote config is a very simple concept, but has a very, very powerful outcome. The idea behind remote config is that it allows you to store variables for your application on the server instead of within your application itself. So um, the neat thing about this is that sometimes you might want to change the state of your application, but you don't want to redeploy your application. So you can have your application read a variable off the server, and then based on that variable, your application can change its state. Let me give an example behind this would be, say you're building an e-commerce application, and you've got a standard discount that you give to a particular set of users. Say anybody who bought something in an in-app purchase in the last three months will always get a discount. And right now, your discount is 10%. So what you can do is you can put the 10% as a remote conflict variable on the server, using analytics to determine who those users are, and then as, as you're using your application and calling analytics, you're saying, yes, this is a person who's um, made a purchase in the last three months, I'm going to give him a standard discount, the standard discount is 10%, it's continuing. Right. But now I want to host a sale, and now I want to really show love for my people who've made in-app purchases in the last three months, and I'm going to give them a 50% discount. Right. Think about how you would engineer something. Uh, with a remote config variable, it's just made really simple. I go into remote configuration in the console, I change it to 50. And I've built it already to read the actual value from the remote variable. And now without me changing my app, without me redeploying, without any updates or anything like that being required, they're going to get a 50% discount instead. And it's as simple as that. Um, I can also be a little bit more intelligent on the back end, that I can use analytics on the back end as well. 
and I can say, well, you know what, I love people in Austria, I'm going to give them 75%. I don't like people in Ireland, uh, and I'm going to give them 25%. You know, something along those lines. So the type of intelligence that you can start building into your application by twiddling stuff on the back end, um, instead of you constantly needing to rewrite code and deploy updates, this is the kind of thing that becomes possible when you start using the code confidence. It's really interesting, it's sometimes really fun, some of the things that people come up with and use it. Another one, and a really vitally important one that we found was testing. And so when you think about if you're building, and particularly on Android, because there's such diversity of Android platform, and if you're building an application and you can test it, part of the feedback that we got from developers was like, I'm in, we may have, for example, a developer here in Austria who wants to build, but maybe a certain platform isn't available in Austria. Um, I don't know. Is the Nexus, the Nexus 6 being invited here in Austria? But then, to so pick an example, a phone that maybe is a phone that you want to target, a phone that you want to build for, but the phone is developed, it's not available in your country, and it's hard to get the answer from the test. How do you do that? Do you fly to another country, buy it, and bring it back? You know, how do you make sure things work? Do you, a lot of times people would go to third party testing companies that have access to all of these devices, but it can be expensive, it can be hard to, you know, to, to manage these things. So we said, we want to build this test lab for Android and make it available to developers. So we have physical devices in, a, in our data center and virtual devices in our data centers. And the idea is that you upload your APK to these devices and it does a set of standardized tests on these devices or it does tests that you've pre-configured on these devices and then sends you back a report that this is what happened. Think about maybe the most common thing is that uh, devices, particularly in emerging markets, might have smaller screens and smaller resolution than they used to, and your button is hidden off the bottom right hand corner of the screen. You know, it's like you may not be able to detect that yourself without the device. So the idea is we build this test lab with AP, you just upload your APK and it will do the test for you, send you back reports, send you back screenshots, and allow you to be able to be successful in the ground. Another one of my favorites is crash reporting. Now, unfortunately, in many ways as app developers, we're hostage to user reviews. If users give us a really horrible review on our application, it makes it harder for other users to buy the application or to download the application because somebody said that the application was garbage. Now, how do you avoid this? One of the top ways that we found that gave, in the Play Store, one of the top reasons that people gave a negative review for the application was the application crashed. It's like, oh, I paid 99 cents for this application and I used it for six months and it crashed up giving it one stop. Yeah, and it's horrible as an app developer, and it's really held hostage to this as app developers. But the number one reason for poor reviews, unfortunately, is crashes. So we said, okay, and the better problem with fixing crashes is if the only feedback you have about the crash is somebody in another country tried your application had a problem with it, it crashed, maybe it was a user error that caused it to crash and they give you a negative review. You can't communicate with that person, you can't connect with that person, you can't figure out why your application crashed, all you see is a one star in the Play Store, and it, and it can really hurt. Uh, so we built crash reporting into Firebase, and then you link the Firebase libraries in, what will happen is that when users get crashes, then they crashed up, including things like a stack trace, will get uploaded to the Firebase console, so you can go in and see why. Now, you may not prevent that person giving you a one-star review, but at least you can figure out why the crash that they had. And then from that crash, you'll be able to diagnose what went wrong and hopefully be able to fix it so you don't get future one-star reviews. Oh, by the way, you're going to see this is probably a theme at the top. It's integrated with analytics. You know, we've really built analytics all the way through this platform so you can start using analytics to figure out maybe it was somebody who did an in-app purchase on a Tuesday and then uh, downloaded something on a Thursday and then moved countries on a Friday and they got the crash. So by going through analytics and going through the stack dump and the crash reporting, you can see where the crash and you can fix it. Hopefully not get lost on these. So you've got your Android SDK, you've got your iOS SDK, you've got your various web SDKs. This is the stuff that I've just spoken through that help you to enhance them to build better apps. But now, once you've gone into that, you've built your app, your app's also a business, you want to be able to grow that business, you want to be able to succeed with that. 
So a lot of the ways that you succeed with that, most companies, they have massive marketing budgets, and they spend a lot of time, and they spend a lot of money marketing their applications. I don't know about in this country, but there are various games in the Play Store um, that have millions and millions and millions of dollars marketing budgets with movie stars like Arnold Schwarzenegger doing adverts for them. I don't know if you see them in this country, and every time I turn on TV, I'm watching sports, and it's like he's advertising this application, or there's a, a model came up to this map with this advertising another application. And I don't know about you, but I can't afford to have them advertise my app. Can anybody hear? Okay, yeah, good. Oh, one hand. <laughs> Let's see that uh, so, um, so how do we grow our applications, given that this is the competition? Given that people are able to put multi-million dollar budgets into growing their applications, where most of us don't have that. So we said we want to see what we can do to provide technology to help you grow your application for free. And one of the things in our research that we found that most people who love an app discover it through their friends that they trust telling them about that. Or in my case, my children. You know, I have a son who seems to spend an hour every day in the Play Store discovering new free games and downloading them and playing them and throwing them away until he finds one that he likes. And then he'll come to me and go, Dad, you've got to see this game. And then it's a great way that I've discovered this game and I can play it. Now, not everybody has a son that awesome. And, uh, so, uh, <laughs> and, uh, so um, a great way that we can discover applications that is like, you know, from friends, people from family around the world, that kind of thing. So we wanted to build a way for developers to be able to share. So if I download your application and I'm using your application, and I think that it's awesome, and I want to share it with my brother who lives in Ireland, I'm not going to pick up the phone and say, hey, go to the Play Store and type this into the search engine, and what do we use in that Okay, go to the App Store and type this into the search engine. You know, I just want to be able to have something within the application, a button that I can press that says share, and share with people who know. And that's the idea behind App Invite. So for you as a developer, it's just a widget that you put into your application that allows for app sharing, and then you don't. For the end users, they can SMS links to the application in the Play Store, they can email links to the application in the Play Store, and they can also get recipient suggestions from Google. And you've probably been reading a lot recently about how important artificial intelligence is becoming. You know, we're trying to build artificial intelligence into everything that we do at Google. So, for example, even something like this, the recipient suggestions, it's not just going to be a random list of people. It's going to be a list of people that comes up that's sorted based on machine learned uh, criteria. So, for example, if what I go in and I'm taking a look at saying, hey, I'm playing a war game right now, and I'm really enjoying this game, and I want to share it with somebody, it's going to take a look at my friends who play similar type of games, you know, bubble down towards the top of the list. So again, for you as an app developer, it's made it a little bit easier for the end user to be able to share your application. And then it's built on a technology called Dynamic Links, which I'm going to show you next. And Dynamic Links are a way that you can provide a user experience via a URL that maintains state across an entire session. So, oh, by the way, this is analytics too, so you can see the theme here. Um, the idea behind this would be, say, say, for example, if I go to the Play Store today and I find your application, and I have a URL for that application, and I send that to my friends, and then they click on that, and then they forget all the traffic, and they don't do anything else. Then, it, you know, then the idea of that share could be lost. Now, with dynamic links, is, say I'm on level three of the game, and I'm really enjoying this game, and there's something really fun in level three, I can actually share a dynamic link to level three of the game, share that with a friend. The friend doesn't have the app installed, they install the app, and then they're probably level three is a bad example, but then they're you know, the state of where I was in the game is maintained through all of that section. Let, let me give another one like, for example, cooking and recipes. So if I am in an application and I see a recipe that I really enjoy, and I want to share that recipe with a friend, then they don't have the application, they go to the Play Store, they install the application, they'll be taken straight to that recipe. And that's the idea behind the dynamic link. So instead of thinking about all the friction that typically is there, where it's a case where I have to tell them the app, I have to tell them the name, I probably have to tell them the publisher, because it's 500 recipe apps. You know, once they open that, then they're like, what's the recipe again? You know, all those steps that make it a little bit more difficult. Dynamic links ideas, they all of that, right? 
Google AdWords then, of course, is a um, a way of you growing your application. So don't confuse. I don't want to. I always confuse these myself, and hopefully don't confuse them. The idea behind Google AdWords is that these are adverts for your application rather than adverts that you put in to your application. So if you want to advertise your app so that people who visit similar sites, people who use similar apps, you know, people that you want to target to be able to understand and learn about your app, if you've got a little bit of marketing budget you can spend on it, then the idea is that Google AdWords does that for you. And again, we think it's built on one of the best, if not the best, and most intelligent ad platforms for matching, you know, the person with an advert so that you're not giving diaper commercials to people who are playing sports games and vice versa. You know, the idea is that if you're building a sports application, you want sports fans to see an advert in your application. And as a result, you know, the, the AdWords platform is very good at doing that for you. Perhaps one of my favorites, if not my favorite, and I spend a lot of time on this technology, is app indexing. And app indexing is um, it's, it's very hard to understand at first, but then once you get it, you got it. The idea is that right now, how do people discover your application? They may discover it through friends, they may go to uh, magazines with reviews, or, some, or any of these things. But we found that a very common thing is, I'll use sports as a theme again, is that somebody may have an application for a particular sport. I'm going to use baseball as an example. Because um, I have like about five baseball apps on my phone. And um, you have all these baseball apps installed, but then you want to see, you know, I come from Seattle, our team are called the Seattle Mariners. And what do I do if I want to know how did the Seattle Mariners do yesterday? I go to Google search, right? I go to the search box on my phone, and I'll type Seattle Mariners score or something like that. But I've got all of these apps on my phone already that have that content in them. I even have the Seattle Mariners app, right? But I forget to go to that app. I'm going to go to the Google search box because we typically, when we're looking for information, we go to a search box. We don't think about going for that. Most users are that way. But if you were building that app, you could actually integrate it with Google search. So now when you go to a search box, instead of being, like if I go to a search box and I start typing something like Seattle Mariners score, Google search is indexed a bunch of websites, and it's going to give me the most appropriate website for the score. But if you put your app using app indexing into the Google search index, now when somebody's searching, your app could be surfaced instead of a website. So it's a great way for you to be able to re-engage with the users. And remember the scenario I spoke about earlier, and I'm sure most of you have done that, we built an app put it into the store, you know, you've maybe done a little bit of marketing, you've gotten a bunch of installs, and then three, four months later, nothing. And how do you maintain that? How do you keep people coming back to you? The idea behind app indexing is that you can use Google search for people using usable, using Google search to get into your app to be able to get to your content directly. So they have your app already installed, why not render the information in the app? And it's typically much richer to be able to render it in an app anyway than it is to you know, render it on a mobile website. And then in addition to that, you know, if you think about this logically, if people are using your app regularly to access this type of content, doesn't it make sense that people want your app to access this kind of content? So through usage of your app, it could impact your app to be better in search ranking results later. So, for example, if every day I open up a particular baseball app to look at baseball scores, then I'm sending a signal to Google personally to say that this app is important to me for this kind of content. So then in the future, I'm much more likely if I'm searching in the search box to get that app surfaced. And as a result, it's very, very simple for you to build app indexing into your app. And it's a great, great way for you to grow your app. It's a great way for you to keep the users that you have already to re-engage with. So notifications. So I spoke earlier on about Google Cloud Messaging. And notifications of Google Cloud Messaging and Firebase Cloud Messaging go hand in hand. But the idea behind notifications is we wanted to make it even easier. So Firebase Cloud Messaging generally requires you to have a server, and this server dispatches messages on your behalf or on your users' behalf. It allows for upstream and downstream messages. It allows for you as the app developer to push messages to folks. All those kind of things. But a much simpler thing and uh, to allow for quick re-engagement as far as notifications, which removes all of that infrastructure. You link uh, the Firebase into your app. You don't do anything else. And then within the Firebase console, you as the app owner or your marketing people or whomever can type in a notification.
notification can pick based on analytics who they want to send that notification and send that notification. And in Android, if your app is in the background, so they'll receive a notification in the system tray, and then when the user touches on that uh, notification, your app will get relaunched. So thinking about this, instead of as a notifications technology, we like to think of it as an engagement or a re-engagement technology. So that you know, if folks have you know, downloaded your app, they got your app from the app store, they used it a few times, and then they forgot about it, it's a great way for you to remind them about it. Maybe using analytics, you can see people who haven't opened your app in a month. If it's an e-commerce app, you're going to tell them about a special offer. You can send them a notification for that, and then they can receive that notification and go back into your app. So that's the technologies that we're talking about for growing. We spoke about the technologies for earning, I'm oh, sorry, for building. And then finally, it's really for earning. We all want to earn money off of our applications. Most of us aren't doing it out of the goodness of our hearts. So the idea, <coughs> excuse me, the idea is that we wanted to make it as easy as possible for you to give you the best possible SDK for that. And so AdMob, you may be familiar with, we've rolled AdMob, we've rolled Google's AdMob into the Firebase SDK as well, so you can simply unify this. And it gives you like uh, typical engaging formats. It's not just banner ads, video ads, it can be interstitials, it can be native ads, ads, all that kind of stuff. And there's, we find there's over a million apps using AdMob, but much more importantly, there's a massive inventory of adverts within AdMob, so you can get that relevant matching that I was talking about earlier on. If you're building a sports application, people who are looking at their application as sports fans, they're going to receive the type of adverts that are relevant to sports. So that's it. That's a you know 45 minute tour or so of Firebase and what's available in Firebase. And I hope this has been helpful to you because I don't want to see it just as a product pitch or anything like that. It's really we did we spent a lot of time. Many of us have spent many years in software development. We've taken a look at what works for software developers. We've taken a look at what doesn't work for software developers. But for me, most importantly, when we look at who succeeds and why. And we look at, it's perhaps a little bit unfair. Some people are able to succeed because they can spend millions of dollars on marketing. Some people are able to succeed because they have great big cloud infrastructures behind them, or teams of thousands of developers. We said, look, let's look at some of the habits of those companies. Let's take a look at the habits of some of those successful ones. And let's build a framework that allows you as an Android developer to be able to reach that same level of success. In most cases, at absolutely no cost to you. And that's Firebase. That's why we built Firebase. Thanks for coming to DroidCon and everybody enjoy it after this. Thank you.